Feliz Sabado, everybody. Daryl, that was so sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, praise the Lord. Two out of the last three weeks, I've been able to come, and I thank God for that. I praise God. Uh, if you only knew what's going on behind the scenes still, you'll see that this is a real miracle, and I love coming. I just love coming. I love Janet Van Wise's newsletter. I love the way she puts it together, and I love the particular story uh, of, of the man showing how important it is to be together at church. That was so beautiful, and I, it just fills my heart to be here. I missed when I was uh, in the hospital so long and then rehabbing, so uh, I'm just so glad to be here. And I come and uh, hug Porky, and Porky tells me these beautiful stories of his father's conversion and... Uh, it just melts my heart. You hear these things when you come to church, and you encourage one another. I met a new uh, mom and daughter uh, today and brought them to Sabbath school with Brian and Brenda, and uh, that's just so neat. So it's so wonderful to be here, and it's so wonderful. You have the viewing audience that is at home. Some, some of you are so far gone in other states, and yet you're tuning in, and I know you, and I'm in contact uh, with some of you, and uh, I pray for you too. And uh, you're part of us because some of you regularly tune in uh, for whatever reasons you have. We're just so glad that you're part of our, our fellowship as well. All right. Uh, please turn to Psalm 145. Please turn to Psalm 145. And on your way there, let me ask, how many of you have considered themselves to be a fan of something? How many of you are a fan of something? Daryl, what are you a fan of? Music. music. You certainly love music. When I was at your house, you told me some of the people you enjoyed. All right? Who else is a fan of something? Just a couple more. What are you a fan of? Any kids that are a fan of something? What are you a fan of in the back? Can someone tell me what he said? Mario. Uh, the Mario game? Is that right? Oh, cool, cool. All right. Um, I'm a fan of the Broncos. Amen. And... Uh, John Elway actually played against my high school in Los Angeles while I was in high school. So I used to sit in the stands, was not an Adventist, on Friday night, watch him play and crush our team. <laughs> and then I moved to Denver, married my wife in Boulder, and went to Bronco games to see Elway there. So uh, glad Russell Wilson's coming our way. All right. What are you a fan of? Fan comes from the word fanatic, right? And there are sports fans, fans of celebrities or TV shows. Some are fanatical over cars or even walking 18 straight miles like one of our members just did. Unbelievable. Well, you know you've met a fan when they always turn back to their favorite subject, but the main idea of Psalm 145 is this. If you're captivated with God as your king and savior, you will be fanatical about praising him. Amen? Amen. Amen. In fact, this psalm does not contain a single petition or request. There are no calls for help or cries for mercy. It's a psalm, a psalm of praise from start to finish. Isn't that interesting? In fact, it's hard to believe, but of all 150 psalms, this is the only one that has the title, a psalm of praise. Isn't that hard to believe? Out of all of them, Old Testament believers we're so influenced by this psalm 
that they began calling the entire collection of psalms the book of praises just based on that one psalm alone. And the ancient church would recite this psalm over every midday meal. That's how important it was to them. Let's just look at the first three verses to start off. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. In the midst of those three verses, how often is David committed to praising God just on Sabbath? Only when life goes well? David says, every day I will praise you. He's not going to reserve his praise for special occasions. Each and every day he's alive is another day to praise the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Each and every day. All right, several times in the psalm, David says, I will, I will praise you. We see how deliberate and committed he is. Praising God is the priority of his life. Now, some can't help themselves with donuts, and David can't help himself but praise God. <laughs> uh, I will exalt you. Exalt means what? To elevate to a high place, to lift up. Jesus said when he is lifted up, we'll be drawn to him. You know what, folks? If you want to be drawn to Jesus, if you want to be drawn to Jesus, just do what Jesus said. Just what? Lift him up. Lift him up. Elevate him. What does it mean? Lift him up. Elevate him. Elevate him higher than every other attraction in your life. In other words, despite all the things we are fanatic about, despite all the things we use to fill the emptiness in our souls. Go to Jesus, lift him up, and he will fill you, and he will fill you higher. In fact, you know the result of lifting up. You know what it's kind of like? Very, it's very beautiful. Praising God is like getting on an elevator. Did you know that? It's like getting on an elevator... When you lift him up, your own life goes higher. Does that make sense? When you lift him up, your own life goes higher. Your view raises from the obstacles and challenges and heartaches before you to the one who heals and makes us whole. When you lift him up, your own life goes higher. All right? Because... Uh, You've got to wonder, by the way, where David's compulsion to praise the Lord was coming from. Blame it all on that little pronoun, my. Verse 1 says what? I will extol you, my God. You cannot praise him unless he's your God. If he's just your parents' God, or the schools, or even the churches, you say, good for them, glad they're happy. But their God won't do you any good until you become like Thomas, who said, my Lord and my God. You see, David was king over Israel, but God was king over David. Amen? And David loved to let everyone know who God was because God was worthy of all that praise. So in verse 4 he says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Folks, is God parting the Red Sea today? Well, literally, not that I know of. Um, is uh, our, you know, you know, we could think of all these examples from the Bible. So let me ask you, 
If God's not parting the Red Sea today, what are his mighty acts? Now, maybe it's my perspective, maybe there's not one right answer, but here's what I say. If you, it says, praise him for his mighty acts. And I thought, well, many of our members, including me, we don't see a literal Red Sea part, but what do we see? We do see the acts he does in our lives, right? And those can be said in some spiritual uh, way that God does part Red Sea sometimes, obstacles that seem so foreboding that we could never uh, negotiate on our own. God parts them and makes a way. And for us, that was a Red Sea, right? That was a Red Sea experience. So praise him for whatever he does in your life. And those are God's mighty acts today on one level. And I want to add something to this. Why is, import, why is it so important to praise God in our homes? Well, listen to this. If we only pass on to our kids truths and beliefs about God, they may get a good religious education, but they probably won't get God. Along with our instruction, our children need to see us praising God. They need to see that. They need to see us praising God even when we're hurting, even when the outward circumstances look bleak, because the truth is God always comes through when he know, the way, in the ways he knows best, and all the truths we share with our kids won't mean anything if they see they don't mean anything to us. Amen? If they see uh, what we're learning and studying isn't causing us to praise God, isn't causing us to worship him more, that there's no heart response, it's not going to mean much to our kids. But my own kids have told me, Daddy, we see the way you respond to what you learn and what you're going through and how you keep praising Jesus when it's very hard and it makes me want to be strong when life is hard for me. That's the greatest compliment my kids have ever given me. And I, I'm so thankful for that. So folks, praise God. Just don't share truths and beliefs and creeds. Praise him, worship him. Give him the praise that is due his name. Then your kids will see how, how that God is relevant and worthy and real, uh, and he's worthy of their own adoration. Well, in our remaining time, since we can't cover the entire psalm, let's hone in on just three of the reasons David gave for praising God. Verse 3 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. The word fathom comes from the ancient word F-A-D-Y-M, fathom, which was the word for, can you guess? What would I be, what would you think this is? A little piece of what? Thread, little piece of thread. Now this is interesting. Uh, thread was the word, among other things, used to measure the distance between two points. In ancient times, they would take thread, and that was the way they would measure it, and they would come back and say, well, no, it's this, no, it's this far. Uh, that's how they did it. That was the word for fathom. That's where we get that. So our word for fathom came to mean to measure something such as the depth of water under a ship. So how can we not ask spiritually, have you fathomed? Have you and I at least begun to plumb the depths of his greatness to see how big and worthy of praise he really is? Let's begin to do that, amen? amen. Let's begin. When's the last time you were overcome by a sense of awe for the greatness 
of God, the uncontainable and inexpressible greatness is what leads us to praise him. If we don't have a sense of awe and wonder and praise, it's harder to praise him truly and worship him. Now, we may thank him for what he does. Thank you, Father, and that's right and good, but thankfulness should lead to praise and adoration and worship. Um, I tell you, it, it's, it's the, it raises your Christianity your experience to the very courts of heaven. You feel like you've gone to the throne of God when you praise and worship him, when you extol him and lift him up, and your eyes are so focused on him. Think of this. In 2010, our 136A1 became the brightest star ever discovered in the universe. It's not twice as bright or even 10 times brighter. It's not a thousand or even a million times brighter. This star is 10 million times brighter than our sun. 10 million times. Unbelievable. And yet the Bible says God is a being who lives in inapproachable light. You know, the older I get, the more I realize I need a sense of awe, and only our Creator is big enough to elicit the level of wonder that leads to praise for Him. So no wonder Paul speaks of the unfathomable riches of Christ. Do you know what the word unfathomable means? Who knows? What does it mean, unfathomable? You can't reach the what? You can't reach the depths, the bottom. So when Paul says, speaks of the unfathomable goodness and riches of Christ, he's saying you cannot reach the bottom of God's riches and goodness and grace and love for you. There's no bottom. You can't reach it. You think, oh, well, I used it up last week when I blew it. I used it up. God says, no. There's more for you here. Will you go down there? Oh, no. Well, now I used it up. No, God says, there's more for you here. Isn't that wonderful? You can never reach the bottom of God's goodness and grace. All right. Now, along with God's inexpressible greatness, David also praises him for his inexhaustible resources. In verse 15, David rejoices that the eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of how many things? Every living thing. Folks, isn't it true that whenever we're in desperate need of something, we worry and fret, but then God comes through and we say, why didn't I have more faith? He always comes through. <laughs> Why didn't I have more faith? I know by now that he always comes through. Of course he does, though, because there are no limits to his resources. They're inexhaustible. And that's why Paul says, my God shall supply half of your needs according to your, his riches in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great news? Half isn't? Two-thirds. How much? Amen. It's inexhaustible. My God shall supply all your need because his riches are inexhaustible. Great is the Lord, David says. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Despite being a revered king and hero of the masses, David knew only God is great. Listen to this. In 1715, King Louis XIV of France died. He called himself Louis the Great. His court was the most magnificent in all of Europe. He even planned his funeral to dramatize his greatness. His body was put 
in a golden coffin, and he left orders that the cathedral be dimly lit with only a special candle set above the coffin. Thousands waited in hushed silence, not knowing what was coming. But the presiding bishop went off script when he slowly reached down, snuffed out the candle while saying, only God is great. Only God is great. And David would have shouted, what? Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. David praises God for his inexpressible greatness, for his inexhaustible resources. But in verse 8, he praises God for his immeasurable grace. David sings, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. You know what? I got to stop. Don't you wonder what the tune was? Don't you wonder what it would have sounded like to hear him sing this, this out? You listen to these words. They were set to some beautiful tune. Um, David singing, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. Amen. Oh, I would have loved to hear him play. Well, the praises flow like waterfall, don't they? And in verse 14, he adds, the Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. You know what? David believes God is worthy of praise because he knows for himself how God delights in picking us up after we fall. That's what the verse just said. Um, more than once, Abraham lied to important people, yet God called Abraham his friend. Moses committed murder, but God used him to free a nation from slavery. David committed great sin, but is later called a man after God's own heart. Would you use people like this to make you look good? Think about it. Would you give them the job of reflecting your glory? Yet God did. God did. These liars, murderers, adulterers, God chose them to reflect his glory. And that's why David praises him for his immeasurable grace. Now, I know there's not a lot of young people here today, but I did prepare this. Talk about grace Here's something our younger people may relate to. At a college in Missouri back in 2002, Denise Banderman walked into her class for her final exam. Everyone was cramming. The professor entered, took a few minutes to review. Most of it was familiar, but there were some things no one remembered ever hearing. Then the professor sent cold chills up every student spine when he said, this is all in your textbook and you're all responsible for knowing it on this exam. That's the way Kim taught her students. When it came to time, <laughs> when it came time to turn over the test and begin writing, Dan Denise later described her astonishment. I couldn't believe it, she said. Every answer on the test was filled in. Even my name was written in red ink. A wordless stir traveled like a wave over each student as they stared in shock at their completed exam. But here's the kicker, folks. On the bottom of the last page of every test was a note from this professor. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. But the reason you pass the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. Folks, all the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you get the A. Folks, is that grace? 
I would call that grace. And, and, and yet that is such a small earthly picture of what Christ did for us on the cross. We work so hard, don't we? We try so hard to please him. And in the end, all those things aren't going to be what gets us an A, what helps us pass the test to get into heaven. It's what our creator did when he took our place on our final exam of righteousness Amen. and sin. Amen? It's what Jesus did. All right. Now, David says then, you want to know what God is like? He's a God of immeasurable grace. So we began saying by all that of all 150 psalms, this is the only one that has the title, a psalm of praise, this is also the last psalm that's credited to King David. So perhaps he reserved this title for his last psalm to emphasize the fact that all our words and deeds should end in what? Praise. All of it. Whatever you're saying, make sure that it's leading to praise. That will help our guard, guard our thoughts, uh, words and thoughts. So often we want to grumble about someone who offended us and we want to light off on them. Well, instead, turn to praise. What are the good things? What's the heart that this person's trying to do? What does God think of them? Look at the things from God's heart and start praising him. Father, this is an opportunity to love. This is not an opportunity to condemn. This is not an opportunity to slay someone. It's an opportunity to be gracious like you have done to me. Praise affects your whole life. It not only teaches you how to lift your heart to heaven, it teaches you how to grace others. Amen. You cannot praise God while you're slaying your brother or sister. So very important to Look at times of difficulty as opportunities to grace someone, and that will lead you. I thank you, Father, that you gave me the grace, uh, the blessing to grace them, to love them, and that was so much better than slaying them and destroying them. So uh, uh, that's a great benefit of praising God. All right? Um, and this is reinforced, David ending his last psalm by saying all our words and deeds should end in praise. That's reinforced by the last verse that says, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice forever isn't long enough? David ha has to add ever to forever. And the book of Revelation indicates that our words and songs of praise will go on throughout eternity because God is so great in every facet of his infinite being that will never tire of praising him. In fact, in the, king, in the new earth, we'll only find more and more reasons for our praise and adoration to increase throughout the ceaseless ages. Do you believe that? You know what? One of my favorite thoughts is heaven. And sometimes I think, oh, I, uh, I'm sure, is heaven just playing harps, sitting on clouds? Is heaven just singing hallelujah? You know, it's going to be so interesting and wonderful and amazing. But the most amazing thing is, Ellen White says, heaven is a ceaseless approaching unto God. Because he's infinite, we will always, forever, be drawing closer to him. We, we will not become gods, infinite gods ourselves, but think of the growth as we become closer and closer to him and know him better and better and praise him more and more with these revelations. Think of the growth that will take in us uh, throughout the ceaseless ages. So I can't wait for that. All right? 
Um, do you believe then God is worthy of praise no matter what you're going through? Do you believe that? Or are you sometimes afraid that God will stop coming through just when you need him most? Um, friends, I want to tell you, um, I'm facing the fight of my life. Uh, I went through this, this, it was a horrific struggle when the pain was at its greatest. Um, but my back is healed. It is mostly healed. I, I need some physical therapy, some conditioning, but uh, that pain is gone. It's just very stiff and that kind of thing. Um, but it's healed. I don't sit there anymore. Ah, uh, I, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Healed. The problem now is that I'm trying to withdraw from a nerve medicine. Um, it's not a narcotic. I came off the hardest narcotics with not a day of trouble. 25 days of the worst narcotics and um, not a bit of trouble. But this one, we found out through Maria's research and talking to pharmacists, is one of the hardest drugs to get off of. It's called Lyrica. And uh, it's unbelievable. Um, I've been in withdrawals at night when I've, I've tried two different protocols so far and they haven't worked and I sit there and I flip and flop and shake like a fish at night and I don't sleep all night long. I have not slept now more than an hour a night for 15 nights in a row. I had one night of sleep in all that time. Um, sometimes the suffering and torment you think, oh, that doesn't seem so bad. You try it. When you are utterly exhausted and you're flailing and you don't have, you, you want to sleep so bad, and in over two weeks, the doctors keep trying to find something, but the power of this nerve medicine, it, it, uh, it's very difficult. But I want to tell you something. I want to praise God for something. On two different nights, as my groans and prayers were ascending to God by faith, some nights I cannot think at all. I, can, I can't pray. I'm groaning. It's, the suffering is too great. But some nights I can. And on two different nights, always in the same place, it is so sudden and real and startling that I look over to see what it is. This holy presence appears. I cannot see anything except I feel that it's, I feel that it's very tall. I feel that. And I look at it and I go up and down. It's strange how I go up and down, I seem to know that this, this thing is tall. And, and twice they or he has come, and all I can tell you is, all of a sudden, the room and my body's filled with this holy, holy presence. It's so holy, I start getting chills that just don't stop, but not scary chills, just chills of I'm in the presence of something that is so wondrous and beautiful, and um, I don't know what to do, but what it does, this holy presence does not speak nothing. Waves of holiness wash through me. That's the only way I could describe it. Waves of holy warmth washed through me. And this holy presence is so real, folks, that I'm so distracted by his presence that I'm not thinking of my utter suffering at that moment. I am, I am enraptured in what I believe have been two visits from God's holy angels 
or Jesus himself. I, I don't know, but I certainly am here to tell you it's been real and life-changing to me. And I've been so glad that um, God has visited like that because I've needed it so much. And I, I, I pass that on to you because it reinforces that he's the God of inexpressible, immeasurable, inexhaustible love. And that same God will come to you. I feel, God, um, I'm not worthy of any visitation. I'm not, uh, even though I'm a pastor, I'm so messed up in some of my ways, and I feel not worthy like you feel not worthy. I go through my own human struggles, come on. And yet, he still comes. I still say, as many of you do, how is God going to get me through now? Now this trial has raised to another level because they can't find a sleep medication so far. So I could sleep. They keep trying. Nothing works. He keep, he's done miracles up to this point. But how's, how is he going to come through now? I may lose my job if I can't sleep and come. What's going to happen then? I love preaching the gospel and I want to, need to take care of my family. Well, you know what? I keep getting reminded God has always come through. He'll keep coming through. And because of his inexhaustible resources that we read about, there's no reason to believe that when you or I have a trial that is bigger than we've ever faced before, that God suddenly can't do anything. Amen. That's not true. There's no trial we could face where God says, you know what, hey, it was good while it lasted, wasn't it? <laughs> we had a good run, didn't we? Uh, but now, sorry, my powers can't do this much. My powers, uh, no, folks, God can get the medicine I need, or God can do something to my body, or God can calm me, or God can help you facing cancer or uh, bills or school problems, whatever it is. So who wants to praise him today? Amen. Who wants to praise him? Praising God punches holes through our fears. You think of it that way. When you're, fear, you're stuck in fear, praising God punches holes through our fears, and they're decimated. Um, and, and, and just as we wind down, I want to tell you, hot off the press, a book about Adventist missionaries in the Congo, where the author very honestly shares her fears in dealing with all the threats, crime, murder, spiritualism. You would not believe what goes on there. She has found that despite the biggest threats, even though she keeps thinking, oh, God protected us today, but will he do it tomorrow? Very human. He keeps doing it. And just a couple examples Listen to what they have to trust God for, just a taste. Sometimes, as they're riding their motorcycles into town and they're preaching the gospel everywhere, snakes suddenly appear coiled on the handlebars of their motorcycles or crawling out their pants. Where did those snakes come from? Satan. The, those snakes are not natural snakes. What do the missionaries do at that moment? What do you think they do? They pray to the God of inexhaustible greatness, and the snakes disappear into thin air. Since, since witchcraft is huge there, even children get initiated. One young girl would sneak out of her home in the middle of the night to join other girls in the jungle. Uh, and uh, what happened there, they were demonically taught to do supernatural works of darkness. Unbelievable what happens there. But finally, one night, a group of holy angels appeared and said, what are you doing here? There's no time for this. Jesus is coming soon. And the group never met again 
and the girl gave her heart to Jesus. How many times does God come through for them? Every time in their biggest battles, even though they sometimes wonder if God will stop coming through. You know why that's impossible? Because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Isn't that good, good news, Brother Tom? It's good news, isn't it, Carolyn? I will never leave you or forsake you. We need to know that today, don't we? Because we, Jesus is coming soon. And if you watch TV, which I don't watch much anymore of now on the news, I watch enough to pray. I do pray for them. But this world is changing so fast, so fast, Jesus is coming sooner than we think, so we need to be ready, all right? Instead of a closing hymn, you know how pastors sometimes sing for their churches? I'm a little reluctant. I'm a little embarrassed. But would you mind if I sang today? Other pastors have done it, right? They do it for their churches all the time. Um, I'm going to sing today. That's my promise for our closing song. However, we'll do it a little differently. Here's a hybrid approach. We're going to play a song that I sung when I was an intern at the Colorado Springs Church. And I assure you, whatever voice I had then, I lost a long time ago. But it makes it more personal than just listening to someone we don't know. But here's the real reason I play the song today. Here, here it is. The words of this song are so encouraging because they fit the message and they're true. They're so encouraging because they'll, they're true. Um, I'm going to need... Uh, Joe, do you flip... Do you know the song to flip it yourself? Or where is that thing? Okay, thank you, Frank. Thank you, brother. Um, let's put the words on the screen. Do I do that? I think Joe's... Joe, you're going to do that or do I do that? Uh, All right, let me just give this last bit of instruction. Um, the message of this song is so beautiful. Um, you know what? I was thinking, and this is an unusual thing. If you're comfortable, if you want to stay in your seats and absorb the message of this song and sing along, do it. If you feel comfortable standing, do it. It's up to you. But I will call for everyone to stand in prayer after. But if you don't know the song and you catch on to the melody, start singing as you catch on to the melody. That's fine. It's a very easy, repetitive melody. But surely get the message of the song and don't laugh at the singer. All right, Joe, let's go. <laughs> He cannot move it. There is no storm or tsunami. God cannot calm it. Calm it. There is no sorrow to deep. He cannot soothe it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders. Brother, that he will carry you. And if he carry the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know.
my sister and he will carry you. He said, Come unto me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. No problem to pay. I cannot solve it. Solve it. There is no mountain to talk. He cannot prove it. There is no storm or no surprise. Isn't that a beautiful song? How many have heard this for the very first time? Oh, really, really, wait, wait. Wow, isn't it beautiful? He will carry you. Scott, Mike. I forget the author. Look at, Google it. Google the, the original. It's so, so, the message is so beautiful in the song. Folks, let us stand and pray. Dearest Father, we want to be like David for sure. So in awe of your mighty acts and inexhaustible greatness that praising you is the most natural thing to do. Not the thing we struggle to do, but the thing we most easily do. We expect mighty challenges but we expect a God of infinite power and grace to be more than enough to get us through and defeat every evil attack. So come soon, Lord, so we can be with you forever and ever, walking by your side, sitting at your feet, praising and extolling you for all the ways you kept us faithful and sheltered under your wings during the hardest times. But until then, let us keep praising you even in the hardest times so the world can know that you really are worth praising and giving our whole lives to. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs>